the little town you've probably zipped right by as you head to Oahu's, to or from Oahu's North Shore. But there's a lot to Laie, from its humble past to its ever-changing future. KITV Force Ashley Moser takes us there. It's where you live. Near the northern tip of Oahu sits a town deep rooted in its culture and history. Where life's fast pace slows down. This is the country lifestyle. It's spelled L A I E, which is La Ie. The old timers say La Ia. When we hear La Ia, we know they're from the from the original group. <laughs> the area also known to those who live here as the gathering place, open and welcoming for anyone willing to make the trip up the windward side or through the north shore. But that's not how it used to be. This was the area. And there was a the wall that went from from the beach side all the way to the back. Hawaiian historian Sai Bridges says Laie was once a pu'u honua or city of refuge. A man-made wall protected its people during times of war and discord, but it also presented opportunity. There was an infraction, uh, doing something wrong, or, or you were a warrior that people were trying to get after. If you were, if you crossed the boundaries, then you would be safe. People in Laie will tell you it feels safe. Many residents attribute it to the strong spiritual influence. In 1865, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints purchased land in Laie with hopes of giving people there an opportunity to thrive both spiritually and financially. The land quickly turned into plantations, harvesting kalo, cotton, and eventually sugarcane. New settlers opened a village schoolhouse, educating members of the community. And in 1879, they built the Ihe Molele Chapel that would serve the church members for nearly 50 years. In 1919, on the same grounds, the Laie Temple was built, and it still stands today. Although the town draws influences from around the world, it's a place still known for its family values, friendships, and fishing. To feed the masses, the community would fish right here at Pukilao Beach. Boats would travel to the edge of the bay, pulling traditional nets with lau leaves. They'd roll it down to the water and it would go out and take the whole bay, they'd cover the whole bay. And then when they said hooky, both sides would start pulling the nest in. And by the time the two groups came together, the bag would be there and they'd pull in three to five to seven tons of fish, not pounds, tons. Oh, that was so fun. And everybody knew they were going to get fish, they were going to take home fish and everybody was going to eat fish. But that was exciting times for us. In the 1940s, the fishing tradition presented an opportunity to raise funds after the old Ihemolele Chapel burned down. Community members provided entertainment and food using fish straight from Hokilao Beach. They charge $5 per person for luau. And anybody passing by, they would stop and what they're doing over here? They would come and the group raised enough money to build the chapel that today sits down the hill from Laie Temple. The project was so successful it continued year after year and it eventually spawned the Polynesian Cultural Center. The spark of that fire is on. The attraction brings in millions of visitors to Laie each year. It employs students attending BYU Hawaii, the university founded from that early missionary schoolhouse. The Hukilao also influenced this local eatery, Hukilao Cafe. It's tucked away in a residential neighborhood just a few blocks from the bay. The cafe is actually in addition to the original Pang store, now known as Sam's store, named after Laie native chef Sam Choi. We sit there and we eat this pake cake and soda. And while eating this local treat in the late 1800s, a local Laie boy named Joseph K. Kuku invented the steel guitar in this very spot. He used to sit out there and play his guitar, and then his, comb, his metal comb fell out of his pocket, and it hit the string, and he was really impressed with the sound. So he worked for about 11 years to perfect it. Other notable Laie natives, professional football player Mantai Teo, and this man, seen in the middle wearing a King Kamehameha costume, his name is Hamana Kalili. Notice his hand? He has only two fingers, his thumb and pinky. It was an industrial accident at Kahuku Sugar Mill. 
His three fingers got cut off right here. Old timers say they used to see him on the old sugarcane trains. Well, when he was on the train, the kids would do this so that, you know, you know Hamana is on the train and you don't touch the cane when he's on the train. <laughs> And from that child's play, the shaka was born. Child's play, also alive and well here at what they call the beauty hall. Every kid that grew up in Laya learned how to swim there because it's so deep, you can't touch bottom. But over time, developers realized its true value was in real estate. So they filled it in, flattened it out, and covered it with this home. Development would become a common theme as Laya grew. It still is, and it's still divisive. <laughs> Today, we see a new hotel, new shops, and debates over a new traffic light. A project to expand affordable housing around BYU Hawaii, including building 875 new homes here, is in the works. Despite change, residents feel this place will continue to hold on to its roots. It continued to be a pu'uhono because it was a gathering place of the faithful, of the believers. They came from all over the Pacific and the world, and they built a community. In La'ie, Ashley Moser, KITV4 News.